We continue our series of sermons as we mark the 40 days of justice in this Lenten season. We have talked about justice being the foundation for the kingdom of God on earth. Justice is far more than doing what is right or fair. Justice is doing what God would do if God were in complete and total control of all things on earth. We have talked about the poor and how they are all too often denied the fair treatment and justice that they are due. We said that the Bible holds nothing back when talking about the poor and that God has a special place in the divine heart for the poor. We talked about those who experience injustice because of their race. We recognized the fact that if we truly believe the race question in the United States was settled in the 1960s or with the election of an African-American president, we are horribly mistaken. Racism is alive and well in our nation today and expresses itself in subtle and not so subtle ways. Which leads us to the topic for today, justice for the stranger. This one might get a little tricky as we have all been made more than aware of the issues surrounding refugees and immigrants and how they might be treated by those asking for our support in the upcoming presidential election. It is not my intention to offer partisanship from the pulpit. We don't do that here. That's not what we are about. But I am reminded of the famous story told of the 20th century theologian Karl Barth. Barth suggested that in order to be a faithful and effective preacher, you needed to have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. In other words, if you're going to be a faithful and effective preacher, ordained or not, professional or laity, the Bible and daily events need to be in conversation. That's our mission this morning. So we're talking about justice for the stranger in our midst. Let's get started. When you go to the pages of the Bible, beginning with the pages of the Old Testament, you cannot help but notice time and time again that you hear special mention being made of the alien or the stranger in our midst. You heard it again in our reading from Deuteronomy. When you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of the tithe, more about that later, giving to the Levites, the aliens, the orphans, and the widows so that they may eat their fill within your town. Do a word search for alien, stranger, or foreigner in the pages of the Old Testament, and you will be astonished at how many laws and instructions are given for the care of those who are not part of the community. Fields were not to be harvested clean, but crops were to be left in the field so that the alien and the stranger, as well as others on the lower rungs of the societal ladder, could be sustained. Strangers and aliens were to be received as guests at festival times. Special accommodation was made for the stranger and the alien in the courts. The distinction between those who were in and those who were out was to be narrowed as much as humanly possible. The playing field was to be made as level as possible, realizing that there are always distinctions and differences. God's justice, the foundation of the kingdom of God, was for everyone and not just for some. When you go over to the pages of the New Testament, we find Jesus breaking down the same dividing walls that were being challenged in the Old Testament. Read the Gospels and you will discover that Jesus was continually confronting injustice and especially the injustice of domination. And he sought to bring justice to all people by teaching that we were to be servants of one another. Jesus confronted those in power with their abuse of power that made some people less than others and quite often made them a little less than human. In the practice of healing, Jesus challenged those religious powers 
who exercised their domination of the people by saying that healing could not be performed on the Sabbath or that forgiveness could only be received through the temple rituals. Whenever unjust power was exercised for the benefit of some and the detriment of others, Jesus spoke up. And whenever someone sought to exclude anyone, including enemies, from the circle of love and compassion, with the reminder that we should love not only our friends but our enemies, Jesus challenged that behavior and taught that it was unworthy of the kingdom of God. Jesus showed compassion towards Samaritans, making a Samaritan the protagonist of his most famous parable and celebrating the compassion of a Samaritan, an outcast, over the faithfulness and piety of religious leaders of his day. <coughs> Jesus made a tax collector one of his disciples. Jesus spoke to a Syrophoenician woman in an explicit revelation that the kingdom of God was not just for the Israelites, but for the Gentiles, the non-believers as well. Strangers, foreigners, aliens, all found a special place in the heart of God and in the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ. Read the Bible and you cannot fail to see it. Study the customs and traditions of biblical times and you will rediscover just how radical and far-reaching the gospel truly is. That we are talking about immigrants and refugees in 2016 should not surprise anyone. In the church, we have been talking about refugees and immigrants ever since the Vietnam War. In the 1980s, the Reverend John Fife, the pastor of the Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Arizona, and the moderator of the 204th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, established the sanctuary movement in the United States. We true Presbyterians, and not just those who claim to be, have been involved in the plight of refugees and immigrants for a very long time. And we should make a distinction between those two words. An immigrant is someone who leaves one's country for another for the purpose of betterment, social, financial, and educational. A refugee is someone who flees a government, flees certain injury, flees life-threatening danger. Because if they stay in the place where they are, they may find themselves in great danger. Now we can all agree that a government's responsibility is to ensure the safety of all its citizens. And we can all surely agree that our history is made richer because of the wide variety of people who have come to our shores and, make it, and made it home. Immigration, the welcoming of the stranger, <coughs> is a complicated and incredibly lengthy process made all the more lengthy because of the political strife within our Congress. We need a safe and effective immigration policy and procedure. No one can argue with that. But when it comes to refugees, we have a moral obligation to provide whatever safety and sanctuary can be provided to shield these people from life-threatening danger. This is the message of the God of the Bible. When our sisters and brothers are in danger, we are to shelter them, provide for them, care for them. There is no wiggle room on that matter from a faith point of view. We see the needs of the hundreds of thousands, even millions of Syrians who have fled their country in the despotic regime of Bashar al-Assad. We see the millions crossing our southern border who have fled Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and the life-threatening dangers of drug cartels, cartels that are economically supported by the largest consumer of illegal drugs in the world, the United States. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, as of their June 2014 report, which is the most current, there were 59 and a half 
million displaced people in the world, with over half of them being 18 years of age or younger. That is the current state of affairs in our world and the backdrop against which our presidential election is being played out. Bring faith into the subject once more as we turn for home. People of faith must always find ways of offering a compassionate witness to those who are being demonized in much of our current political discussion. No rational person would want to be a refugee. No rational person would undertake life-threatening journeys with only what they can carry on their backs in search of safety and security for themselves and their families. People of faith must always find new ways of caring for the refugee, the alien, the stranger, the foreigner, providing for them until they can safely provide for themselves. This is a moral and ethical imperative. It grows out of the compassionate heart of God that seeks to include all people in the kingdom of justice. What happens when faith and politics collide? You saw it just a week or two ago when Pope Francis challenged a political view that says build walls to keep people out instead of building bridges to welcome people in. The world went nuts. How dare the Pope involve himself in politics? Now look, I owe Pope Francis nothing. I'm not part of that union. The respect I have for Pope Francis is because of his authenticity and genuine Christian faith. When you dare to raise the faith side of the equation to any of the great political challenges of our day, there will be more than a few who will tell you to butt out. The last thing the world wants to hear is what God has to say. Look at what we did to God's greatest messenger. He came among us talking about love and justice and mercy and compassion. And what did we do? We nailed him to a cross. The world rarely appreciates God's view on anything because it threatens the power and the domination and all that goes with it. What the gospel calls each of us to do is to examine our hearts, our faith, our belief, and then vote accordingly. The gospel, the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ comes first, each and every time. Whatever party or candidate best reflects that good news is the party or the person who is worthy of your trust in your vote. It's just that simple. We need not fear the stranger in our midst, for that is nothing more than an insidious form of racism. We need not fear the alien who dwells among us, for that is nothing more often than injustice toward the poor. We are to be the living presence of the living God. We are the body of Christ in the world. And as Teresa of Avila reminded us, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks in compassion on our world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body on earth but yours. And that is frighteningly and awesomely true. For now and evermore. Amen.